singer, songwriter, model, actor, TV host, but probably nothing describes him better than the word sensation. He burst onto the scene in the 1990s and told us all, you better work. Dressed in high fashion glam, he broke down barriers for drag performers and became a household name. With a message of love one another, he's recorded with music legends Martha Wash, Diana Ross, and Elton John, and has even appeared in both Brady Bunch movies. Hello, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with supermodel of the world, RuPaul. Life, communication, consciousness, it's the blood, it's the physical blood of, of communication. When I've connected with someone on music, I, I know them. It's like a shortcut to their intellectual DNA. Could there have been the popular RuPaul without music? I don't think so, because I think my whole expression came about, I knew that I could express myself that way through music stars like David Bowie and Cher and Diana Ross, Sylvester, you know, that's where I gravitated. You know, young kids have a hard time articulating what they're feeling, so they gravitate toward pop stars, and they can go, that, that right there, that's what I'm feeling right there. And that's why uh, it's young kids who buy music, and then when people can learn to articulate they stop buying music. So, you know, you have this, uh, you have 11 year olds who buy music, and I think it trickles off to nothing at 29 is when people stop, except for, of course, Absolutely. you and I. Yeah, what, what does that say about us? <laughs> We've you not know, learned to communicate? No, I think it means that we really love music for what it is and, and beyond what it, uh, how it expresses our, our, fe- our feelings, or, you know, I think it, it, it means that we're really true music lovers. To make our conversation easier, is there some name that you give to the glamour drag RuPaul as opposed to you, RuPaul? Well, you know, when I'm talking about myself with, say, my manager or uh, other business associates in mixed company, like in a restaurant, rather than say my name, I uh, will say, oh, the monster. You know, <laughs> we'll say, oh, you know, I'm so and so saw the monster on the Howard Stern show or whatever, you know. Um, but I'm Ru. Um, that's, that's, it is confusing. My real name is RuPaul. My people, ever since I was a kid, have called me Ru. And, of course, people in public call me RuPaul, which is my first name. So for our purposes, why don't we refer to me in drag as the monster? Is the monster truly a monster to you, then? Is it out of control at times? You know, I think there are, all, both, there are two sides to every monster, because um, it is out of control to a certain degree. Uh, I'm a very chill person. I'm very chill. It takes a lot of energy to uh, conduct the energy when the monster is, in, is, is up and running. There's a lot. People give me a lot of energy, and I have to give off a lot of energy. It takes. It's so. It's. It's almost out of control. It takes a lot of restraint. It takes a lot of poise. How much energy does it take to put the monster on? Uh, it doesn't take much. You know. In fact, I enjoy. I enjoy the process of of getting ready, especially um, now that especially. Um, being at a, uh, my fighting weight, it's not as fun <laughs> when I have to do a lot of shading to sort of <laughs> to, to cut out certain uh, when, I've, when I've gotten overweight. Like I was telling you when I was uh, editing the movie in post production, I, I ate whatever I wanted to. But then when I had to go back to work, um, you know, it was like, uh oh. <laughs> Take me back. What was RuPaul like as a child? Who were you? I, mean, I, I, I was a sweet, sweet little boy, very kind very um, well-mannered and misunderstood because I always saw many colors in the rainbow. And a lot of people feel threatened by that. A lot of people have a vested interest in not seeing the colors because they don't want to remember who they really are. It's too much for them. So um, I went out searching for 
people who could speak my language, you know. And luckily for me, my sister Renetta, who's seven years older than me, she she speaks it. She speaks it, not as broad, but she was the closest I could come to uh, having someone uh, to take care of me. When I was a, a little boy, I think I may have been five years old, she took me, she said, um, she got a bag of cookies in a brown paper bag and a blanket. And she, and she said, we're going on a picnic. And she, we went out to the canyon. I'm from San Diego. We went out to the canyon. We lay, laid the blanket out and had these cookies. And she said, this is a picnic. And looking back, I realized that was my first, one of my first introductions to making something magic, that you can change every situation by your perception of it and how you choose to see it. Yeah. How did your parents' divorce affect you, do you think, as a child? My parents' divorce was really traumatic, and I didn't know how traumatic it was until much later when I started to peel away the layers of myself and understand that I had to, uh, I had to sort of leave my body to be able to deal with what was going on there. My parents, uh, this story, I've told this story before. My mother once poured gasoline all over my father's car. It was in the garage of our family house. She stood over it with a pack of matches, threatening him, saying, you know what, MF, I will light this thing up. She was a fiery lady from uh, southern Louisiana, um, Creole, mulatto lady, out crazy, firecracker. Anyway... (laughs) <laughs> and and there's the fire checks are there. My father's there. He's saying, please, Tony, please, don't, don't. You know, she was mad, she obviously mad at him. And the fire trucks were there, and us uh, four kids were across the street watching this scene. And when I think back on this scene, I am look. I'm out of my body, looking at me and my sisters, and looking at the scene like if I'm the camera, looking at myself. So years later, I realized I, as a little boy, had to. Get, leave my body to be able to deal with such a traumatic experience. Obviously, she did not set the car on fire. Good. Sister Harris from the church talked her out of, you know, lighting it up. But um, that's just one example of what my parents' divorce was like. But because those kind of incidents happened, in your mind, is it better that there was a divorce? Oh, yeah. These are people who <laughs> never should have been together. These are people, I think probably should never have had children, you know, maybe had children for all the wrong reasons, whatever. But, I mean, we're here, it's fine. But uh, it was um, it was not something that you'd want little babies to go through. Yeah. But it made us all very strong. We, me and my three sisters, developed a strong sense of humor and a strong sense of uh, independence from it. Where did you go after the divorce? Did you stay with your mom? I stayed with my mother, and my father uh, moved out, and we stayed in the family house. My sister, Renetta, still lives in that same family house. Of course, she's added on tons (laughs) to it. But, um, yeah, I stayed there in San Diego uh, until I moved in with Renetta, who then moved with her husband to Atlanta, Georgia. When did you first start deciding... And to create on yourself, I guess, is the best way to put it. Early on, even when I was a kid, you know, I, I had to do some type of, uh, I had to find an outlet for my imagination and my dream time, you know, dream time in reality. And I would put on shows. I would write songs. I would entertain my mother because, you know, she was a very, uh, she was she's pretty dark. She was pretty um, world-weary. So I knew that I could get her attention and I could lighten up her up um, by doing uh, impersonations and jokes and all that. So I could, I could get through to her that way. Many years ago, we actually did an interview, and you referred to becoming the monster as not dressing as a woman, but just making yourself as beautiful as you could be. Was that more because in that period of time, it was easier to sell it to the American public as just glamorizing or was that really how you approach it? Was there a sense of impersonating a woman or not? Where did it come from? Well, there was really never a sense of impersonating a woman. If, if anything, it had more to do with a, a critique of our culture. You know, being the only boy in an all-girl family, uh, I've always been intrigued with looking under the hood psychologically of our culture and uh, deconstructing femininity or beauty or all that stuff. So 
dressing in drag the first time really had more to do with being told not to do it. So it was sort of my punk rock statement to say, you know what, F you, you know. Um, so, and then uh, from there, the power, I became addicted to the power it gave me. People would look at me and go, whoa. And I'd be like, <laughs> what, whoa, you know. And I, re- I realized I had something going on with it. So I said, okay, sure, I'll do it for a couple of bucks. Sure, I'll do it. And then, and then it just took on its own, its own life. And that's why the monster is like, okay. You know, I, honestly, I really couldn't stop doing it. As I couldn't stop doing it even if I wanted to because somehow clearly the universe needed me to do this thing. And in fact, I resisted for a long time because, you know, I always wanted to be famous. I always wanted to do show business. And when I decided to come above ground, not underground, but above ground, I said, well, I'll come out and do my sort of androgyny thing. Um, but people, the audiences would be, you know, it's cute what you're doing, the androgyny thing, but when are you going to do Star Booty again? And I'd be like, oh, I Explain get what it. Star Booty is for Well, people. years, 20 years ago, I did this character, Star Booty, um, it was sort of black exploitation superwoman thing, uh, uh, and it became a cult classic. And people around the United States, everybody knew about it. So when I would travel in my nightclub act in the androgyny thing, uh, uh, people would remember the Star Booty character and go, "When are you going to do that again?" So I I learned from that experience that. What am I, why do I need to reinvent the wheel? I've got this thing that people want. Why not do that? And it was a major revelation for me. People say, who discovered you? What was your big break? My big break was unlocking my own mind's limitations in thinking that it had, I had to do it one way. Yeah. And it was major. I mean, that's, we were talking about the Spice Girl. It was major, major. <laughs> when did you realize how beautiful you were as a woman? Because uh, there had to be a moment when all of a sudden it's not just costume drag, that people are going to find this image beautiful. You know, I found out from other people because the first drag I did was more of a, uh, what they call gender F, which is um, the F word. Gender F means where you're doing it in this sort of punk rock, you know, smeared lipstick, combat boot type thing, you know, and, you know, it's more of a statement. And even in that form, people would react to me differently. And I I could feel that my frequency and what people were picking up was different from what it was otherwise. And I understood the power and I became attracted to it that way. And, and, People would say, you know, you're beautiful. And I'd be like, oh, weird, you know. And then, it, and then, it, I, I, it, it, uh, then I, I accepted that and, and played with that. A question I've asked before of other people, and now it's your turn to answer it. Mm-hmm. Were you ready for the fame at the point that you got it? When Supermodel hit, was that the right time for it Absolutely. To hit? I thought it was going to happen a lot earlier. <laughs> I really <laughs> did. I'd been in show business for 11 years already, you know, Sleeping on couches, scraping money together to get food and all that stuff. I'd been doing all that stuff for 11 long years. And then when I decided, okay, I've reached the pinnacle downtown in New York. Time for me to go above ground. Uh, it took me about a, almost a year of working on my demo tape eating popcorn and seltzer water from the movie theater that my friend worked at because I didn't have any money. <laughs> and, um, and I was ready. I, you know, this is the funny thing is that I was always, I wasn't like the most popular kid in school, but I was always a standout. People always knew my name. My na- real name is RuPaul. And, uh, you know, I was uh, six feet tall at probably 14 years old, you know. <laughs> so I was always a standout. Yeah. So I was always a star, so to speak. So I understood what it meant. And then, even in that context, from junior high school and high school, my popularity would wane, even in that context. Yeah. So I understood how it worked. I understood that it was a, a commodity that was useful and could be used. Supermodel, huge. You know, you better work. All of that. 
at that point, how did you know, or did you, that America would buy it? How did you know that they would be comfortable with this six, almost seven foot tall drag queen? It wasn't the time. I mean, now things are different. But back then, how did you know it would work? You know, it's interesting. I've observed pop culture all my life. I've always sort of stood on the outside looking in at our culture. And there was a window of opportunity that opened. It was very clear. We had been leading up to that. Also, you know, politically, um, Clinton was in office and the Democrats had, you know, sort of this, this social way of thinking had come into our consciousness collectively. And uh, it... It, it felt right, and the people I got into business with at Warner Brothers felt it was right. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was, you can, you could taste it in the air that it was right. That's how we knew. Um, I don't think that could happen today. I think, honestly, that drag today isn't, uh, isn't as accepted right at this moment as it was then. I think that gay, even with gay people, gay people are really obsessed with everything that's straight acting. You know, I, I'm born in the 1960s, so a lot of my formative years were in the 70s where we as a culture, not just gay people, but everybody was into um, pushing the envelope and um, women's liberation and rights and civil rights and gay rights and the sexual revolution. People were into expanding. After the and then even the, during the Reagan era, it sort of started to shut down more because of the AIDS crisis and all that stuff. It opened up a little bit again during the Clinton time, and that's when I snuck in there. Mm -hmm. And then it, our fear-based culture closed it down all over again, where people want to do safe things and doing using femininity as a palette in a patriarchal society is akin to an act of treason. That's why um, let, you'll find Ellen DeGeneres or other l popular lesbians, and they'll report on their love life. Like, uh, look, here they are holding hands. Are they going to adopt? Oh, they're buying a house together to, you know, in a, you know, a, a lovely way. But they won't do that about two men, two star men. I don't know how many stars out there who are men who are openly gay. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, Lance Bass and the guy Riken, they did a little bit. But it, it always had a tinge of, hmm, thing to it. That's just our culture. Yeah. It's our culture. In your life, have you found more prejudice from being African American, from being gay, or from being drag? Which one do you think was the hardest? I think I, I've definitely found more prejudice in our culture from being gay than from being black or from being a uh, drag queen. Really? Mm-hmm. Why do you think that is? I believe that it's linked to, and I have a theory on this, I believe it is linked to the death of the goddess in our culture, goddess energy. I'm not talking about feminine with Hello Kitty and pink furry <laughs> animals. I'm talking about feminine goddess energy and how there was, there are theories that there's a conspiracy, there was a conspiracy to shut it down from the church and all this kind of stuff. And I think that, the um, the proliferation of patriarchal culture is uh, a big the biggest reason that men using femininity or, fem or women using femininity even is uh, is is looked down upon because it's p people are afraid of it people are afraid of it people are afraid of a very smart woman. Uh, Okay, shallow question now. Mm. There you are, dressed in drag, performing with Elton John, Diana Ross. What goes through your mind at a moment like that? You know, it was going through my mind the other day. I did the Howard Stern show, and I was thinking to myself, Rue, be in this moment. Remember this. Taste it. Don't forget it. And I've, I've had a lot of practice at saying to myself, be right here, right now. It's amazing. And that's what's going through my head is, is remembering every bit of it. And, and, but still trying to be in the moment of it. Because I, I, I'm pinching myself is what's happening. Because I'm thinking, <laughs> I conjured this up. I had to have conjured all of this up. You know? Did you ever feel like I'm really pulling the big one over on everybody? You know, <laughs> here I am dressed as this like glamour queen. And I'm singing with all these big stars. And I'm really just this guy who got here you know there's a certain part of me that 
d does, but I think there's a bigger part of me that knows that uh, if you plant seeds, it, they grow into big, beautiful trees that have fruit, and I know that that's true, and I know that I, we are co-creators with Buddy or, or God or whatever you want to call that thing. We're co-creators, so we can conjure up whatever experience we have here. So, um, yes, there's a part of me that says, I'm, I'm pulling one over, but a, there's a bigger part of me that says, you know, I, I did this. I made this happen. When the popularity started to wane again, I think it's easy to want popularity, but to have had it and then it starts to feel like it's not there, what does that do to you? It was, it was perfect. First of all, I've had that happen in my life before I got famous, where, you know... Um, people that, that, that were, you know. So what I did with that, it coincided with my ha have had enough of all of that for a while. You know, I took several years away from all of that to enjoy the fruits of my labor, to have barbecues and house parties and tea parties for my nieces and nephews. And I created a real social life for myself in Los Angeles, which you have to do in Los Angeles anyway. And I, I was turning 40 around that same time, so it was, a real, it was a real perfect time for me to go within and to say, what's going on? And having been to Oz, Dorothy, you know, it's like, what do you do after Oz? After you've said, I want to go there, and you get there, and you're like, great, let's party, let's do it. Let's do it. And then you're like, okay, what, what am I going to do now? I needed time to sit out and go, okay, what are my goals now? What, um, what's going to motivate me now? So, and so that's what I did. I took time to, to go within. And I know that there was some personal issues that you dealt with, too, at that period of time. And I'm wondering, how does having fame and success and seeing the world from that point help you during low points in your own personal life? Well, you know, that's, well, fame, that's if fame is actually a high point. You know, on a, on a career, career-wise, fame and getting the money and all that stuff is a high point. Uh, on a personal level, there was a, an emotional deficit during that time because I had spent so much time going, Oz, Oz, Oz. I didn't really invest in the emotional my emotional evolution. Stepping away from it allowed me to really invest in my emotional evolution, which is, which has brought so much to my my work, uh, you know, as as a performer. But uh, uh, I I wouldn't trade any of it. It's been so great. In fact, you know, we talked about frequency earlier. You know. If I am, if I have the clarity, I can hear what the universe or buddy wants from me or is urging me to do, you know? Like even when I realized that um, I needed to do this in drag and that I was the only one stopping, I had to, I'm so proud of that moment because I was clear enough to go, that's it. That's it. That's what I need to do. And the same is true today. Never a moment where you wish you hadn't done it in drag. No, no, no. It's it's so clear to me that this is this is this is my open sesame. And when that moment happened, when I realized Eureka, it the universe said open sesame. <laughs> Everything opened up. Like, God, that's it. Got so it. now you've brought Star Booty back. Yes. Why? What made you decide that was the way to go? It's fun. It's a fun movie. It's total debauchery. It's totally politically incorrect. And our culture so needs that. Our culture is, is so lopsided now. We're so off key. We were in the airport earlier, and it, it, seemed, it seemed like some, um, uh, that Aldous, is it Aldous Huxley, um, 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 you know, Brave New World, that guy, uh, George Orwell, where there's a loudspeaker going, if you see someone doing something, please tell on them. <laughs> or or it, it's this, this, this hypnotic training us to be stay in fear big brother is watching you look out for people who are not with who are not patriotic or you know it's crazy and for me who've always who's always looked at the, our society from the outside i'm like oh my god we've gotten there we're there and it's scary uh so i wanted to do star booty as this is my gift to the young people who 
who maybe uh, I can influence and to say, look, there's another way to skin this chicken. There's another way to see yourself. There's way more than is being presented to you. Is it a good time to bring the monster back into the public strong? Absolutely. The monster really speaks to the possibilities. And it says, you are not this body. You are not your religion. You are not your politics. You are not your race. You are not your gender. This is but a, sh- a short run on this planet. You go on forever. But while you're here in this beautiful gift, you've gotten this role, have fun with it. Love it. Give love to somebody. Let somebody love you. Yeah. It's funny, though, that you call it the monster because it is such a creation of joy and fun, unlike so many drag performers out there where it takes kind of an edge to it, a right. negative slant, and it just seems almost wrong to call it a monster <laughs> because of what we think of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, Rue, I cannot thank you enough for sitting down and talking with us. Such a pleasure to have you here. And we look forward to many more years of a lot of fun and entertainment from you. I love talking to you every time. I have a great (laughs) time with you. You're wonderful. Thank you very much. RuPaul. To order a DVD of this or any episode of interviews, please visit HoustonPBS.org.